This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We are now into the chapter concerning contract law, and I have said at the start of each of the previous lectures that I will again repeat now, and that is that there is no need for you to remember case names nor case dates, nor titles of legislation, nor section numbers, nor years of legislation. There's no need. These will not be asked, and there is no opportunity for you to show your knowledge of this if you did learn it, even if you did learn them all, and the years and the courts in which they were determined, there will be no opportunity for you to demonstrate that knowledge. Do not try to think about remembering case names, they are not important. However, the principles that those cases establish or that they reinforce, those principles are important. And this contract law chapter that I'm about to start, and it's going to take a number of lectures, this contract law chapter contains a mass of case names. They used to be important in, in when the old days before the formats changed to multiple choice and there were 10 questions of 10 marks each and 10 essays were required. The last three were scenario questions and you had the opportunity to bring in cases and demonstrate, illustrate it, the, the principles of law by quoting case names, but they're not important now. So they are still within the course notes. I will talk you through some, principally the ones which I personally find particularly interesting or amusing. Uh, but they do illustrate principles, and those principles are what you must remember. Enough of that. Let's move on. So a contract, we're into contract law here. And contract law... It's obviously the law as it relates to contracts, but we need to know what is a contract. And a contract is an agreement supported by consideration made with intention to create legal relations. It's, it's an indication of one's willingness to be bound upon certain terms and the acceptance by somebody else of their willingness to be bound upon these specific terms. So that's what a contract is. It's an agreement, first of all. It's supported by consideration, a major point, made with intention to create legal relations. And each of those three elements has to be present in order that our, an agreement shall be deemed to be a contract. Now, nowhere in that definition that I have given you, nowhere does it mention anything about being in writing being witnessed, being stamped, being author or authorised by some citizen's bureau uh, office where they stamp it and sign over it and date it and stamp it and look for your passport. No, that's not necessary. A contract is an agreement. That's it. It may be just me talking with you, me making you an offer and, and you accepting that offer, just orally without any writing or requirement of writing, with no necessity to have witnesses. It could be oral. No, likely it would be in writing because it's difficult to establish the existence of an oral contract unless there are witnesses to that oral contract. So we have an expression that says an oral contract is not worth the paper that it's written on. Well, of course, it's not written on any paper and therefore it's not worth anything. It's too difficult to prove. So to be safe, you would have a contract in writing. But it may be oral, and it may even be by conduct, where two people conduct themselves as though they were in contract, then the court may deem that a contract does in fact exist. So ideally it will be in writing. But no, whatever, it needs to be supported by consideration and it needs to be made with the intention to create legal relations. So let's get back to the notes and, and we'll go through the notes and I'll illustrate things. And on this first page alone, I can see instantly on the screen, I can see one, two, three, four, I can see five cases there. 
where I will talk about some of those cases, but not them all, because it's going to take much too long, and the cases, names are not important, but the principles are. So, for instance, in this Bell's case, goods in a shop window is, uh, are invitations. It's an illustration of the point that an invitation is not the same as an offer. When you see goods in a shop window, those aren't being offered for sale. Those are invitations inviting you to go into the shop and make an offer to the shopkeeper and say, oh, I noticed something in the window I would like to buy. Can I buy it for the indicated price of three pounds or ten dollars? That's you making an offer to the shopkeeper, and it's up then to the shopkeeper to accept or reject that offer of yours. But So this Bells is the part of the name of a case which illustrates that goods in a shop window are invitations and they're not offers. But the principle is that goods in a shop window are invitations, they're not offers capable of acceptance. Some of these cases, then, I shall talk about. Others, I shall just glaze over them and mention the principle of law. Okay, so an invitation needs to be distinguished from an offer. And an invitation is inviting someone else to come along and make you an offer. If I invite you to make me an offer to buy my car, and you say, okay, Mike, I'll buy your car, for $300, and then I am in the position where I can say yes or no, I can refuse to accept. I invite you to make me an offer. The alternative is if I offer to sell my car to you, I'll sell my car to you for $500. This is not intended to create legal relations, so don't think you can accept it. So I'll sell my car to you for $500. And you are in the position of being, you're in the position of saying yes or no, and that will create the contract. You are the potential acceptor of my offer. So I make the offer, you accept it, we're in contract. Alternatively, if I say to you, I'm looking to sell my car, would you like to buy it? Will you make me an offer? That's me inviting you to make an offer to me. So now you make an offer of $300, and now it's up to me to decide whether or not we are in contract. And I'm thinking, sitting here, thinking 300 I would like 500 actually. But 300 I wonder if I can get him up to 400 So, So I'll say, no, 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 no. 300 is too little. i tell you what, what about 400 I, I might accept 400 Now... What I have done there is I have rejected your offer. Your offer no longer exists. I've, I've killed it outright. It no longer exists. It's not there on the table. Instead, I have made you a counteroffer. So I have rejected your offer and made you a counteroffer. No, I'm not accepting 300 but you can buy it for 400 Now you're in the position of saying, hmm, 400 I don't know. Should I buy it for 400 No. No, I'll, and you say to me, no, 400 is too much. I'll pay you 350. So you have rejected my counter offer and you have replaced it with your own. Your original offer of 300 no longer exists. My counter offer of 400 no longer exists because you have now got the last offer on the table, 350. And I'm saying, no, I'm rejecting that. I'll go and find somebody else that's prepared to pay me 400. So now you turn around and say, because I've now rejected yours, I've killed your offer. You now say, all right, then I'll pay you 400. And I say, no, I wouldn't sell it to you now if you were the last person on earth. If yours was the last $400 on earth, if I had not a single cent to my name other than the car, which I think is worth 500, but I'm prepared to sell for four, I wouldn't sell it to you because you've messed me around. You wouldn't offer me 500, you offer me three instead, which is derisory, an insult. I suggested that you pay me four, and you insulted me again by coming back and saying 350. Well, you can go away and get lost, I'm not selling it to you. And you say, well, you wanted 400, I've offered you 400. No, you can't accept an offer. Once it's destroyed, it's gone. You swept it off the table. You said, no, no, I'll not pay 400, I'll only pay 350. You were the one 
that killed that offer of mine of 400. Invitation. I invited you some time ago to make me an offer to buy my car. I would like 500 for it, but I'm inviting you to make me an offer. Do you remember? I invited you and you made the offer. 300, you said. An invitation must be distinguished for an offer because an invitation is not capable of being accepted. I'm inviting you to make me an offer. I'm looking for 500. You can't turn around to me and say, I accept. Because I'm inviting you. I'm not offering to sell the car for 500. I'm inviting you to make me an offer. So that you say, I'll buy your car for 500. And then I can say, no. Because you made me the offer. It's up to me to accept or reject it. Invitation is inviting a lot. I've just done that with you, haven't I? I invited you to make me an offer to buy my car. You've not seen my car, have you? It's not worth 500. So... That's what an invitation, how, that's how we distinguish invitations from offers. Now, there are some interesting situations here, some fascinating situations, like, for instance, goods on a supermarket shelf. You may think that goods on a supermarket shelf are offers, and that you going along and taking those goods and putting them in your basket, that's you accepting the supermarket's offer. And so you go along and get it all cashed up and you pay. No. Goods on a supermarket shelf are invitations. The price underneath them is an indication to you of the price that the supermarket may be prepared to accept. But it's not a term of an offer because the goods on the shelf are themselves not being offered. Even though it may say offered for sale. Even though it's a special offer. Two for one. It, even though it says that, this is not an offer. Get that in your mind. Because goods on a supermarket shelf are invitations for you to take these goods, which may be wrongly priced. It may say goods on a supermarket. They may have a, a price tag of one. And it should, in fact, be ten. And when they were, when they were being priced up and the labels being stuck on, they made a mistake and, and missed that zero off. So there's this $10 washing powder looking like a $1 washing powder. You say, yes, I'll have that. I'll have, that. I'll have four or five of those for $1 each. You can't lose, can you? I can go away and sell these for seven each and still come out making a lot of money. So you go on to the cash desk and you put your, your washing powder on the, on the, the, the moving belt and it's cashed up and the cashier rings it up and you're watching the cash still and it says ten dollars whoa 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 no it's not ten dollars it says see it's one dollar it says i'll show you on the shelf come with me and i'll show you on the shelf there washing powder one dollar and they say oh that's a mistake sorry uh, you're offering to buy you putting these goods there in front of the person checking them out scanning them through the scanner you are making the offer and the supermarket is in the position of accepting your offer. And you are offering to pay $1. And the supermarket is saying, no, we're not accepting that. We want $10 for our washing powder. Remember, and it may prove valuable to you so you don't embarrass yourself in future. Remember that goods on a supermarket shelf are invitations. They're not offers. Goods in a shop window are invitations. This, that, that, that case there about boots is a, a case that involved boots cash chemists. Boots cash chemists, the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain, and boots cash chemists. That's why I've abbreviated it to boots, because in the leaf you'll see I've got boots, bells, birds, and balls. And so when it was important that students remembered principles as well as case names, these quick uh, one-word reminders were easy to remember. So that was a case involving Boots Cash Chemists. It's a, a large chemist chain in the UK, for those of you that are not from the UK. Goods in a shop window. Goods in a shop window is a, is a, a case which involved um, the defendant called Bell. The case is called Fisher and Bell. I'll write it down, but remember, there's no need for you to remember the names. Fisher and Bell. 
The Fisher and Bell was about a Glaswegian uh, shopkeeper and had put in the window um, a flick knife. I'm assuming that if you are from the UK, you do know what a flick knife is. It's an offensive weapon. And you press a button and the, and the blade flicks out. Uh, so it's an automatic um, offensive weapon. You push that button on the handle, this blade flicks out, and you've got a deadly weapon in your hand. And so the Offensive Weapons Act, or the sale of Offensive Weapons Act, comes into force here, and it is against the law to offer for sale an offensive weapon like a flick knife. And in the case of Fisher and Bell, the policeman was walking past the shop and he noticed this, this flick knife offered for sale in, in Bell's shop window. So he reported him and, and Bell said, no, I give up, go away. So along comes the Crown Prosecution Service and, and they take Bell to court and they say, we're going to prosecute you on the basis that you are offering for sale an offensive weapon. That's contrary to the offensive weapons legislation. And Bell defended himself and said, no, it's not. Goods in the window are not offered, even though it's a special offer. These are not offers. These are inviting people to come in. And, and they, they're going to come into the shop and say, and that flick knife in the window, can I buy it? And I'll make you an offer. And I have always said, whenever people come in, I have always said, no, you can't buy it because that would be against the offensive weapons legislation. What you can do, though, is you can buy this set of knuckle dusters that you can take to the, your next football match and, uh, and use them as necessary. But he was not offering for sale the flick knife. It was an invitation, tempting people to go into his shop and make an offer, only for that offer to be rejected because offering for sale or selling offensive weapons was against the law. Adverts are normal invitations. It's a general principle here that an advert, 99 times, 999 times out of 100, 1,999 times out of 1,000, an advert is an invitation. And the law and the judges and the courts are deeply reluctant to go against this principle that says an advert is an invitation. And there's a, a case involving birds. It's funny enough. The, the name of the case, I'll give it to you again. But it's a case called Partridge, which is, as you know, a type of bird. Partridge and Crittenden. And Partridge and Crittenden was about a pet shop. I think it was in Nottingham, I may be wrong. doesn't matter. Uh, and within the window was an advert that said, um, Bramble Finch Chicks which is, a, a bramble finch is another name for a brambling, which is a species of bird. Bramble finch chicks offered for sale, uh, and, and it gave a price. And it's against the law, because a bramble finch, or a brambling, is a protected species of bird, and, and it's against the law to offer these protected birds uh, for sale. And it said clearly, bramble finch chicks offered for sale. It's like one shilling and sixpence each. So the Royal Society for the... For, Protection of birds, the RSPB, prosecuted uh, Crittenden, took him to court and said, uh, you're offering for sale. Your advert in the window says offered for sale. Advert in the newspaper, offered for sale. Clearly said offered for sale, bramble finch chicks. But it was an advert, said the court, and adverts are presumed, even though it may say different, adverts are presumed to be invitations. So even though it said offered, that wasn't an offer. But now the big one. Very occasionally, adverts may be taken to be our offers. And this is a, a big case. When we come to company law, you'll find that the big case, the one, the grandfather of company law, was a case called Solomon and Solomon and Company Limited. That's the one which firmly established the concept of a company being a separate legal person in law, separate and distinct from those who are beneficially interested in the success or failure of the company, separate and distinct from those who are responsible for managing the affairs of the company. A company is a person itself in law, established, confirmed by Salomon and Salomon and Company Limited. That's the big one in company law. In contract law, 
And it comes up, this case appears in a number of situations. And I'll explain why and I'll give you the detail of this case because it, it is um, almost omnipresent throughout contract law. I keep referring back to it. And it's this case here, it's Carlyle and Carbolic. And it's about Mrs. Carlyle. And the Carbolic is the short form name for the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. You may or may not know what a smoke ball is, um, because since my very young childhood, I've never heard of them since. But when you had a, a batch of, when I was a child, and we're talking a number of years ago, you may not think so, but I am. When I was a child, I had a bad chest, a bad cough, or a runny nose, for instance. Uh, my mother would take me into the kitchen and put a chair in front of the sink and have me bend over into the sink. And what she would have is a, a washing up bowl underneath, and inside of that was a jug. And she'd put a smoke ball inside the jug and boil a kettle and then pour the boiling water onto the smoke ball and quickly push my head over this and put a towel over the whole lot. So there was no escape. My mother in the background was wearing a, a black pointed hat and muttering things like eye of newt and leg of toad and holding my head over this foul, noxious fumes that were coming out of here. And you had to breathe them because there was no escape. You had the towel on. I'm only a little boy. My mother's a grown up and she's bullying me to breathe in this foul stuff. And that's a smoke bomb. Horrible things. The Carbolic Smoke Ball Company advertised and said, we'll pay anybody a hundred pounds if they catch influenza having taken a course of treatment of our smoke balls. Anyone, a hundred pounds. It's an advert. Mrs. Carlyle bought some of these smoke balls. The course of treatment was a 28-day course of treatment. Dreadful. On the 27th day, she started sniffling, sneezing. On the 28th day, she's got candles coming down her nose here. She was horrible. She was in a terrible state. In bed under the doctor. And that will not go further there. She's suffering like mad with flu. And she's taken these, this course of treatment, this 28-day treatment. 27 days she's already in. She persevered and took the 28th, but she still had influenza. So she contacted the Carbonic Smoke Ball Company and said, I've been taking your course of treatment. I've taken it for 27 and 28 days. I've done the full course of treatment. I've got influenza. And it says on your hand, it says it will positively cure your uh, snoring. It will stop your snoring, give you a restful night. It will prevent you from contracting influenza and, and generally help with your health. And so... She sued and said, I claim my hundred pounds. And they defended themselves. Now remember an advert, normally 999 times out of a thousand, an advert is an invitation. They defended themselves on five counts. First of all, they said the offer was too vague. There was no time period. Surely they cannot be expecting you to be free from influenza for the rest of your life. And therefore, it was much too vague. There was no time period specified. And so the, offer, the, the, the claim that it should be a contract should be rejected. Secondly, self-seeking acts are not sufficient to merit the title consideration. I'll come back to that one. Just let me go on a couple more. Thirdly, there was never any intention to create legal relations. <coughs> they didn't intend to. It was not as though they wanted to enter into a contract. So there was never any, any intention. And the courts, well, about this hundred pounds, is it true that you actually deposited a thousand pounds into a separate bank account to demonstrate your 
good faith in your product and your goodwill with reference to this advert. And they said, well, yes, it is. We did put a thousand pounds. Well, of course, well, why? Why did you put that thousand pounds into a separate bank account if it was not to fund the claims of people who are contracting influenza? They had no answer to that. The next defence was that at the time it was considered not to be not possible to contract with the world at large. If I make you an offer, <coughs> if I say to you I shall sell you my car for $500, that's an offer. If I say to you and the other members of your family, I shall sell any of you my car for $500. I can make an offer to you, an individual. I can make an offer to an enclosed group of people, to a class of people. I can make my offer to the, the crowd that are next watching Berry play football against Blackpool. I can announce over the loudspeaker, I will sell anyone in this crowd my car for $500. That's an offer to an indeterminate number of people because I don't know these people that don't go and watch Berry play in Blackpool. I have no idea their, their identity. So I can make an offer to an enclosed group of people like that. But I can make an offer to 7 billion people worldwide. I can put an advert in a newspaper that says I'm advertising a hundred dollar reward for the return of my dog and that's an offer that anyone can accept. So an offer to the world at large at the time of Carlyle was thought not to be possible. That was another defence. A further defence was that Mrs Carlyle had not made any formal acceptance of the offer of £100 if anyone caught influenza. Well, in a situation like that, it's a reward situation, isn't it? When I advertise a hundred dollar reward for the return of my dog, I don't expect seven billion people worldwide to start sending me notification of their acceptance of my offer. And the same with the Carville one, that when they advertise a hundred pound reward like that, it's as though they are waving, it's a strange word, it's as though they wave their right of communication of acceptance. So. Mrs. Carlin never notified them of her acceptance was another defence. And the final defence, and they're now talking about five defences here. The final defence was that Mrs. Carlin had given no consideration. Now you may turn around and say, well she did, she bought the snowballs. No, that's a separate contract. You're there paying me money and I'm here giving you smoke balls in return. That's the end of that contract. You give me something of value, I give you something of value, contract finished. You're now trying to claim under a separate contract. You're claiming that I owe you a hundred dollars, a hundred pounds in Carlos case. I owe you a hundred pounds. Why? What have you given me in exchange for you claiming that hundred? Well, you've taken these smoke balls. You've taken a smoke ball course of treatment. Yeah, but you did that for your own benefit. And I mentioned earlier, that's a self-seeking act. Something that you do for your own health is something that you would want it to do anyway. And so the court said, well, Mrs. Carl, it looks like you're unlucky there. Have you nothing to respond to that? And she said, do you mean that I've suffered for 28 days and the court said, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean you suffered? And she said, have you never taken a smoke ball? No, said the court. So she said, you should try it. And the judge said, send for Mike's mother a kettle of boiling water, a washing up bowl and a jug and a smoke ball with a towel. And they did. My mother went into court with a boiling water fiddling the kettle. And they put the washing up ball on the desk in front of the judge and they put the jug in front of the judge and they put the smoke ball inside it. And my mother put her hat on and the black cat was wandering around. And she said, put your head over there, judge. And he did. And she poured the boiling water onto it and covered his head with a towel and held his head down and said, breathe that, sucker. And he fought his way back out. 
I couldn't because I was only a little boy. But he managed to. He fought my mother off and said, No, good Lord, how can you possibly have put yourself through that for 28 days? That is suffering enough. It's all right saying a self-seeking act, something that you do for your own health and your own benefit is not consideration. But to voluntarily take part in that act, that is consideration. That is personal, uh, not indignity, personal suffering that you have given. And that is consideration. So the smokeball company lost. Too vague. 28 day time period for the course. She caught influenza on the 27th day. It wasn't as though it was four years later that she caught it. It was there. So the vagueness of the time period was not an issue. World at, the lar world at large, you can make an offer to the world at large if it's a reward type contract. Remember me, my hundred pounds and my lost dog. A reward contract is an offer to the world at large. And a reward contract is where the offeror waives the right of communication of acceptance. So there's no need for you formally to notify me that you're accepting. No intention to create legal relations. Why did you put a thousand pounds into the bank account if you didn't intend to create legal relations? Ah, mm. No consideration. Oh, yes, there was. Mrs. Carlo suffered personal agony breathing in those noxious fumes. And so that was consideration. So this case establishes five separate principles in law. It's a big case. No need to remember the name, just remember the principles.